This is Crossing Phase, the first podcast featuring a Christian and a Muslim talking religion and politics. My name is Matt Hawkins. I'm a former policy director for the Southern Baptist Convention, and my friend John Pinna is founder and executive director of Muslims for Muslims. If you're watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing to the audio podcast wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening to the audio format already, thanks for listening and downloading, and we're pleased to let you know we're now showing our video selves two-dimensionally on YouTube. Uh, if you want to check out what we look like, you'll probably want to turn it off after the fact and, and not watch. You probably want to go back to the audio edition. That's okay. Uh, as always... All of our information is available at crossingphase.com, and we're on Twitter at Crossing Phase. John Pinna, you're looking very ethnically, culturally dressed this morning. You know, you know I feel very much like an Islamic scholar, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that I have no laundry, so I came out of the shower, <laughs> and this is all I had. Although my Tunisian cousins will, will love it because this was a gift from them, but I was uh -huh. racing around, and I'm like, oh my God. So... Um, but I can do the Islamic scholar this yeah. and point. Yeah. I can do that. <laughs> you look the part, finally. We've been doing this podcast for a year and you finally look you, the part. You know, I, I, it's, it's, the embroidery is sexy. I think it is. And, the, and blue has always been my color. So. It, it looks um, good on you. It looks good on yeah. you. You understand so, I'm uh, culturally dressed today too. Do you understand this? Are you? I, I don't see a baseball cap. I don't see a trucker cap. I don't see no. you covered in hay. You know? But it's the, it's the last appropriate week in the South to wear pastels, right? So I'm wearing, oh, what's it's just rule? a polo, right? It's Labor no, Day. Is the no white off. after Labor Day? No, no white, no pastels. We got to turn off the summer colors. So this okay. is the closest that I can get to your cultural wear right now. All right. Well, <laughs> listen, you guys got your own coveralls, <laughs> double alls, whatever. So uh, I'm, coming after, I'm coming off of a birthday and my mother... She had this, look at this card. Look how perfect this card is that she, this is freedom of religion and expression. This is from the, this is from the UN. She specifically got this card for me for my birthday. Oh, wow. So, yeah. It's pretty Listeners, cool. Please, please wish JT Pennant a happy birthday. Yeah. I made it another That's year a here. Cool so card. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty neat. And then I, uh, I ended up taking a, I went to, there's this place up here called the Rhinebeck Airdrome. Yep. And they have biplanes. And uh, I went there when I was a little kid. And I was, you know, my parents were like, we paid for the show. We paid for the museum. You're not getting a plane ride. And uh, <laughs> this year I was able to take the plane ride. Open cockpit. Great. Open Sorry. Open cockpit. Technical uh, difficulties. Yeah, you see. Yeah, it's okay. So open cockpit, biplane. It was kind of neat. Nice. So, um, well, joining us today is a special guest, a longtime friend of John's, and uh, I'm pleased to include uh, another alum from George Mason University. Uh, longtime listeners may start to figure out that the two credentials that make you most likely to be a guest on Crossing Phase are one, you're a religious person of some sort, of some faith, and then number two, that really steers in your direction is you have a degree from George Mason University, which uh, is starting to become a pattern. Um, but uh, Manal Omar, has a bachelor's degree in international relations from George Mason University, also a master's degree in Arab studies from Georgetown University. But frankly, those academic credentials only scratch the surface of her experience and her insights. Uh, so Manal Omar, welcome to Crossing Faiths. Thank you. Thanks for happy, uh, having me and happy birthday, John. I didn't realize it was your birthday. So <laughs> no, I appreciate it. August 24th, you know, so it's one of those days where you know, you're always hoping that mom always makes a cake and she decorates it as if it, well, I was a child, you know, and for the <laughs> same stuff. Um, no, I appreciate that. And it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's always a, a one of those times. I, it's, it's like my new year. I always kind of reflect on how far I've come and where I'm going and all that stuff. So it was, uh, it was a good birthday because I was able to take some more time with, with the family because of COVID and all this other stuff. So Beautiful. we'll talk shortly about uh, Monal's organization across red lines for whom she is founder and CEO. But John, uh, how would you introduce Manal to our listeners? I would introduce, I mean, I, there's, there's a, a long list of credentials uh, associated with, with Manal. I mean, I think that my, the best way for me to describe Manal as, is she's on the cutting edge of the fight that we have within our community and the struggle to uh, 
represent the dignity of the, the human person and who we are as, as Muslims, exploring not only the historical and spiritual background of who we are, but how we express that in our daily lives and how we express that internally with uh, the community, outwardly within the community, but most importantly on how one uh, addresses that within their own value and who they are as a, as a Muslim and as a person. Um, I, I met Manal, uh, we collaborated very, very closely on an event with the Dalai Lama uh, and it was such an important event where we discussed uh, how faith communities deal with uh, uh, identity in a world where there's conflict and particularly obviously with the Muslim backdrop. Um, and uh, I think at that time she was uh, the vice, vice president working at, at UCF, the United States Institute for Peace. And we have a lot of common friends, but I mean, she's worked with a number of U.S. government agencies. She's World Bank, United Nations, Oxfam, and, and uh, has her own organization across red lines uh, right now that deals with uh, the, the, this idea of identity and deals with trauma. It deals with sexuality. It deals with all the words that you don't like to associate in, or talk about within Islam. Um, and she does it in a way that's not only thoughtful, but uh, is uh, a manner in which you can actualize and actually do something about your own self-worth and your own self-expression. Um, and I hope that, I hope that it was a more esoteric introduction, but <laughs> I, I believe that's more of who, who you are to me. Uh, mm. And that is part of what we're, why we have you on is to discuss and talk about um, not only who you are and what you're about, and your organization, but really the idea behind uh, why you came to this place. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, from, from your perspective, who you are, why, how you arrived at, at Cross Red Lines, and really what the purpose of it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I'd love to, and thank you both for such a great introduction. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll say kind of, you know, um, what we were talking about earlier, you know, my background, you know, I was born in Saudi Arabia and my parents came to America when I was six months um, and they chose to be in Texas and later South Carolina. And I always tease them. I'm like, you missed the memo, like immigrants go to coasts. Like, why did you like go, you know, there? And, and over time I realized why. <laughs> True story, I give them a hard time about it. And, and with age, I really realized um, what happened, you know, the, the, you know, the small town, the fact that it was all centered around kind of the Bible in some ways, all of that um, is what they remembered from their background. You know, the, the, you know, when I was in the South, we knew all our neighbors, you know, we, we would go in and out of houses, like the children would play in the streets, there was never one house, you know, like we were just going in and out. And I think that kind of fits the, you know, the Palestinian small town centered around the mosque type of mentality. So only with age and especially Texas because of the oil. So I'm like, okay, you found oil, you found heat, you found small town, like you got it all and, you know, <laughs> came over there. Um, so it made sense with age, but when I was younger, I would tease them quite a bit. And I feel that plus being a woman, um, it set me up to negotiate from childhood. You know, I was always negotiating. I was always explaining. Um, and whenever we would go back to the Middle East, um, everyone, you know, the only thing they saw on TV was Dynasty and, you know, all these soap operas. So they thought we all lived like that. And, and to a certain extent, they questioned our morality. So I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you know, my friends in Texas and South Carolina, they're a lot like you. You know, they don't, you know, I, I grew up with where girls weren't wearing makeup and where, you know, we had curfews. And, you know, there was just a, there was a lot of similarity in, um, I forgot what the word is in English, in the Terbia, and the way that we were raised. Um, so I was constantly kind of an ambassador. In the Middle East, I'm explaining America and, and defending America. In America, I'm defending the Middle East and Islam. So, you know, I feel like my career was shaped for me, you know, from childhood. Like, I, I don't know how much of an option I really had. And I kind of willfully stepped into that role of bridge builder. And that's what I see myself as I build bridges. 
It's pretty fascinating, Manal. It uh, gives us great insight into your talents as a as a translator uh, between cultures, if not if not languages, uh, which is clearly a, a theme of the Crossing Phase uh, podcast. Um, so th- thank you for sharing. I think the, the jolt of people hearing Saudi Arabia to Texas to South Carolina uh, messes with messes with uh, people's categories, which is a thing I like to do uh, here on, on Crossing Phase. Um, can you sh- share us a little bit about your religious background in particular? Um, we, we, we kind of established over time kind of where in the Islam orbit uh, John is. And so anytime we have a guest on, um, I kind of like to get kind of understand better where in mm-hmm. your particular faith um, you reside, uh, might be uh, spiritually or, or theologically. Hmm. Um, I, I think probably I would classify myself as what we call a perennialist in terms of I believe all faiths come from the divine. Um, I feel like as a Muslim, um, to really truly embrace the side of Islam, I need to understand the other faiths and the other religions and particularly the other books. But, you know, I truly believe that all um, faiths come from the divine. Um, I think you know, it would be arrogant to assume that, you know, and I know that the Middle East are problem children, but that, you know, the only religions were sent to the Middle East when there's an entire world, an entire global community out there. Um, So for me, I chose Islam as my path, but I don't see it as the only path. And I label myself more as a perennialist than anything else. Interesting. Um, Can you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, opting into Islam? Um, Maybe how that occurred, if you feel comfortable? Yeah, I mean, I um, I don't know, you know, I always say it, to a certain extent, I think I was fortunate because I grew up with a fairly secular family. Um, so for example, both in Texas and South Carolina, we were active in the church. I went to Sunday school um, and not from a necessarily a religious perspective, you know, you know, understanding the immigrant mentality. My parents were like, whoa, wait, wait, wait time out. You're going to take all five children all day for free. <laughs> so every Sunday that was like their heyday and they were like more than happy to send us there. And sometimes as they dropped us off and like, you know, sped on out, they'd be like, don't forget you're Muslim. Um, but, you know, really kind of grew up with this, um, you know, you know, a, a family that were very committed to integration. And, you know, with that came some downsides, but like that was definitely their commitment. Um, you know, we had a Christmas tree, we celebrated Christmas with the neighbors. Um, and I think for me, there was just a part of me that became very curious. You know, you, you just, I physically looked different. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I was bigger than most of the people my age. You know, I tend to have, you know, more curly hair. So there was just something about me that was constantly like, okay, well, there's something different. Um, so when I would push my parents, um, you know, they, where, you know, my parent, my father's belief, which I believe firmly as well, is, is religion is morality. Like if you're treating people well, you know, the whole do unto others, as you would have them do unto you, then you are a person of faith and you don't really need to go into more detail than that. Um, but, you know, I'm a very proud nerd. I'm a very proud geek. And I was like, I need to go deeper. I need to know everything. I need to know the root. Um, so I, I think I was a seeker. And um, at the age of seven, I had some dreams about the prophet, and that kind of led me to reading about the life of the prophet, and it was almost like I found a home, and I became very entrenched um, in Islam and kind of found my own way. Uh, it's actually funny, my parents were running interventions because they were so afraid that I would become so extreme that they were constantly pulling me back um, to a more, especially in high school, I'm like, all my friends are getting like drug interventions, I'm getting religious interventions, like what's going on? Um, but again, with age, I'm really grateful that they were consistently balanced out that fire that was in my belly as a youth. That's pretty fascinating. Thanks for sharing that that insight. Uh, I think it's uh, always interesting to hear people's faith journeys, uh, particularly when um, uh, maybe they grew up in a in a household that uh, had a particular faith, but um, they didn't just presume it. Uh, they've kind of selected it and kind of owned it uh, or chosen something different. Yeah. So I always like to get those uh, backgrounds to better understand where folks are coming from. That's, I appreciate that. So tell us about your organization, Across Red Lines. Yes. Um, so, you know, as John mentioned, I've worked for several organizations, the World Bank, the United Nations. Um, you know, when I got kind of tired of the big multilateral because I was worried about, you know, how effective are we, I went to smaller NGOs. I mean, no one would call Oxfam small, but, you know, compared to the World Bank, so Oxfam and to Women for Women International and really worked on the ground with civil society. Um, while I was working with civil society, I kind of grew frustrated and was saying, okay, these aren't the decision makers. You know, so I asked myself, who is the decision maker? And again, I was very involved with the UN and the World Bank, and they aren't the decision maker. 
Um, so I realized the US government and um, it was actually a hard shift for me, but I was, you know, I feel like as an American citizen and I, I really do love my adopted homeland that I had the opportunity and access. Um, so when the Obama administration came into play, I came back to the US and I worked for the US government. And after those eight years, you know, 25 years and maybe a dent in the world of conflict, maybe, you know, a hiccup in the compass. Uh, so I had to ask myself again, you know, what really would prevent? Because I was tired of managing and resolving conflict. So I really mm -hmm. pushed myself and said, what would actually prevent? Um, and for me, that became women uh, and particularly women of faith. I think women of faith fall in between the cracks. Um, let's face it, religious institutions aren't the kindest to women. Uh, we've been burned, we've been hung, we've been, you know, stoned in the name of religions. So we tend to have a little bit of religious institutions. And for a woman of faith like me, the secular movement also can be very hostile. Um, so we tend to fall in between the cracks. And I feel like those women of faith can also be the best bridge builders. So when I started talking to some religious working on women um, and for it was women being able to show up whole which means you have to deal with the trauma um, with the fact that they're sexual some of the areas we don't want to address um, from mm -hmm. this lens um, a lot of the religious leaders were warning me they're like Manal, this is a red line you know Ahmad, line. this is a red line like you know we respect you we we love you and you know I've met with some of the top religious leaders in the world um, and they were you know, you have a place in government, you have a place as a mediator, like don't step out into this dangerous red line. Um, mm. Now I'm a Taurus, so you don't want to flash red. <laughs> it just makes me charge further. And that's why I called my organization Across Red Lines, because I wanted to invite those same religious leaders, um, not demand, you know, initially it was called Cross Red Lines, and I felt that was too demanding. I wanted it to be an invitation, come across these red lines with me. And that's what we do. <laughs> One of the things that interests me the most about your organization and, and, and is that it's not a think and do tank. It's more of a, an, an, an operational element within the Muslim community that, that awakens and energizes people to address their own selves within the construct of merging Islamic tradition, Islamic law, and Western concepts. Um, I always, my career is, is, is translating Western concepts to Islamic, to, to uh, collective cultures in Islamic context in the reverse, right? So we have very similar career and it's, it's, uh, it's translating. Uh, but you do this in an active way. Uh, and uh, I, I, can you speak a little bit about your anchor programs and how they are um, uh, actualized to affect people in a positive manner within the community. Hmm, beautiful, and I love that, you know, the idea of like, it's not a think, it's not a do camp uh, tank, you know, if anything, it's a feel. It's, it's a reminder for me that, you know, uh, our, our spirits are here on a journey and, you know, they're in a physical realm, which is the body. And, you know, the body is made from this realm. It's, you know, it's what, you know, one of my spiritual teachers calls our earth suit. Um, and it's our GPS. So the more in touch with your body, with your feelings, then you're in touch with your navigation system. And when you're too much in the think and you're too much in the mind, you lose the navigation. You lose that connection with spirit, which is your guidance. Um, so that's very much what Across Red Line's heart is, is how to return to feelings, how to return to the body as a navigation. Um, you know, a lot of the new age people would call it your higher self, your spirit guides, but you know, it's all internal, it's all within us. Um, and that's what I really work towards. Um, there's a saying of the prophet that is to know yourself is to know God. And so that's what we do is our core program. We work in programs, we do exercises, um, we do workshops that bring again, I mean, the collective consciousness. Uh, you know, one of the workshops is called Build Your Tribe, where you actually build the tribe that you need to support. Because, you know, as human beings, we're not meant to be alone. I mean, this is why I've always loved the religious space, is it emphasizes community. 
Um, and what I try to do is get people to find the I and the we. So how do you balance individualism with collectivism? You know, how do you not self-sacrifice to martyrhood, which is not what we're asked of, um, and especially for women, because we're taught, you know, s sacrifice, suffer, and it builds character. And no, you know, what actually religion wants is happiness. It wants peace, you know. In Islam, sakina, tranquility is the greatest gift. It's the greatest achievement. And so I wanted, and going back to conflict, I wanted to break out of this fight energy of this, you know, constant um, aggression that is landing inside us. It's not landing in the target. It's actually landing in us as individuals and in us as a community, which you see with the growth of extremism. That's the most tangible way to show it. You struck a lot of chords there, Manal. Um, uh, we won't won't go down too much of a rabbit trail, but uh, while Christians would probably think and speak a little differently about the body and and its relation to our our spiritual side, uh, I do recognize that uh, there are a lot of there's some Christians now uh, who are starting to point out. Uh, where Christians have often erred, particularly uh, in the West, is kind of a separating, uh, kind of creating a dichotomy between spirit and, and body, and are trying to re rethink some of those things. So m maybe that's a, a task for me to track down um, a Christian theologian or someone uh, to talk about that from a Christian perspective. But I, I recognize that there's I have some, the perfect person for you. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, um, I am, you know, sorry, just to t say, you know, on terms of that regard, I'm a, a very proud student of Father Richard Rohr. Um, and as someone who grew up in the South, was very committed to understanding Christ consciousness. Sorry, there's suddenly traffic. Um, and, you know, it always eluded me, you know, especially as a Muslim, like I, I couldn't quite grasp the idea of the Trinity and monotheism and stuff. And Father Richard Bohr really goes into great depth about the link that you're talking about. Um, and I think the book to start with would be Naked Now. Um, and, you know, he's, he's quite a, a very eloquent writer, has tons of books, but that's, that's definitely where I would encourage you and your listeners to look into if you're curious. Yeah, interesting. And, and also kind of in my orbit of theologically conservative Christians and scholarship, uh, a lot of scholars are starting to try to reclaim uh, exercise as a common thing that feeds into um, the, their, their, the performance of their mind, basically. Uh, it's maybe not, not broad sweeping, but I do see some upticks in, uh, in scholarly type people. Uh, those of us who kind of professionally live a fairly sedentary lifestyle, uh, trying to kick up our, our exercise habits um, and, and do some good things for our body because they recognize it, it does contribute um, in some positive ways uh, towards our mind and, and our, our spiritual lives. Um, so it's, it's pretty helpful. Um, John, are you doing, are you exercising? Well, you know, one of the three, well, I am exercising. I live right outside the Catskill mountains. So, um, and one of the places that I go to all the time is, is a place called the devil's path, which is, goes from devil's, devil's tombstone, uh, which is Hunter mountain to devil's kitchen, which is Indian head mountain. So I go there almost every morning and, and hike around. But one of the, one of the, the, the core components, I mean, I, one of the main reasons why Manal's organization is 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 uh, not, it's, it's so sexy to me is that I always talk about these three components, and I think that maybe we could chat a little bit about it. One of them, though, is sort of re-energizing the body, and and re-energizing the body from a a, a a Quranic perspective. The idea that you know our spiritual being is in, is encased in this in this body, right? That the terrestrial body. And the idea that not only do we have, that we're fashioned in proportion, right? And, and, and then, and Allah has breathed into us breath, right? And, and, the, and, and the spirit, the idea that we have uh, to take care of who we are on the outward self um, and, and, and energize the body so that our, our, our spiritual self is, is not just intact, but flourishing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm extending this to you, uh, Manal, as, uh, as a question. You know, how does your organization do this? Do this? And I, I, I know you have some specific programming that speaks to this. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, the, the image that I love is is the idea that the spirit is the rider and the body is the horse, and you need to master that that riding of the horse and. 
Um, so what, what we do is we actually bring people together. One is I believe when people come together in the collective healing, it happens naturally. We actually do it upstate New York predominantly is my main location because I try to take people um, into nature. And then the other place I do it is in the Middle East, we'll go out to the desert. You know, there's just something about being completely surrounded by nature that of course connects you almost directly to the divine. Um, and even that is a huge step. You know, women are really willing to invest in themselves for some certification. They'll do stuff for their children. They'll do stuff for their families. But to actually take, even if it's just two days off into nature, it feels so luxurious that it's often a whole hurdle in itself is to just actually arrive and show up for yourself. Um, and then we run through very specific exercises where you kind of tap into the body, you tap into intuition. We do, you know, all types of um, different things, you know, including prayers, including zikr, including sound healing, where we actually sit and just listen to various sounds and allow that, you know, to kind of in infiltrate. Um, and a lot of it is the collective healing of sharing stories. There's so much power in the narrative. Uh, I think this is one of the things that almost saddened me um, doing class. Oh, we got a little Oh, we may have lost her. Stand by. I have this, I have this reconnecting with nature business too. Right. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm gonna, I'm hanging on every word. So, see, it's not like you. You can, you just, you just go out on the tractor. <laughs> I do. I do have quick with... access to uh, to nature out here, um, helping my father-in-law on his his uh, little farm, uh, or preparing it to uh, hold some livestock. And I think I'm due this weekend to help some more on that front. I think we got to chop up some trees uh, along the uh, along the perimeter. Um, so, so like Manal, Manal is going to reconnect with us. Uh, She'll pop back because yeah. we were talking about re-energizing the body, uh, and what I'll do is I'll lead in with with reconnecting with nature, and and get that going. Yeah, you so know, she so. she definitely had some place to go with that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. got thrown out. No worries. <laughs> You're off the <laughs> island. Voted off the. I was, was like, what did I say wrong? The spirits don't like what I'm saying. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Welcome um, back. I think you were talking, you were getting into uh, some of the experiences you share with um, the women you get into nature. Um, and I think that's kind of where you left off. Yes. Yeah, I was saying, you know, we do, so nature in itself or just getting women to take that time in itself is can be a challenge. Um, and then we do very specific exercises. So, you know, there, there's group prayers, there's group meditation, um, you know, a lot of interestingly enough, a lot of people in the Middle East actually didn't have a faith background. So I had, um, for example, a Dutch woman and a German woman attend, which I found to be very interesting that they were choosing a space which is dedicated to women of faith. Um, and what they were explaining to me is the tie between leadership and sexuality is missing in the secular world. So that's what particularly grabbed their attention. Um, we do sound healing, but you know, the most important thing is kind of that excavation to really go to the to core um, in Islam, we believe in something called fitra, which is you're born into a state of purity and life and the journey of life pushes you out of that state. So, you know, kind of that journey is to return to the state you're born in. So we try to access what is that fitra? What is that, you know, purity that you're born into as a spiritual being that comes into the physical realm? And, you know, that's a lot of what we do. And then I bring my conflict negotiating skill. You know, one of the most biggest challenges with human interaction is we want people to read our minds. You know, we will sacrifice, we will love, sensing the people we love know. Um, and communication, and unfortunately these days, verbal communication is essential. So we do exercises that really look at the art of negotiation. And, you know, I, I joke about asking for what you want even when you don't know what it is. And that's what gives people a chance to really respond and build relationships is when you ask, when you're able to, you know, be clear on what you need. I mean, we, you know, we, we started on re-energizing the body um, and the, the, the comment about that and then talking about reconnecting with nature is where you let into, which is the second element that I always talk about because, you know, it doesn't matter which Islamic civilization you're talking about, you know, built elaborate gardens and fountains and, and uh, you know, made sure that, that, that uh, we were reconnecting with nature at, at all different periods um, 
of uh, and trying to reintegrate nature into our complex lives as, as society and bureaucracies were being built. And I think that's really, really important. If you, I was wondering if we could get a little bit more into re, uh, like a reawakening the mind about what it is that I always kind of express how the universe is an expression of, of Allah's will. And, and creation has inspired the diversity of the Muslim community. And it ties into you know, artistic expression, scientific expression, philosophical expression. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how your programming and what your programming does to reawaken the mind. So you know, there's the body, there's nature, and, and the mind are the three themes that I always throw around. But I, I, if we could unpack that a little bit. And from a, a Muslim con construct. Um, and it, I think it's also will help with um, some of our other faith listeners to hear about its, its place in Islam and how you have been seeding that within the individuals that participate in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it's four elements. So there's the mind, there's the body, there's the spirit, and I see the heart as a whole other science. So, you know, even though technically it's part of the mind, the heart in itself, I mean, the body, the heart and the mind are part of the body, it, the heart and the mind in itself has their own science. Um, and, you know, within the Islamic realm, I would say purification of the heart is the best really um, way to examine the, the idea of the heart. Um, what I try to do with the mind in particular and reawakening the mind because, you know, so much of the um, consciousness may try and make the mind the enemy. And you hear about the monkey mind, you hear about the mind that runs away. And so there might be a temptation to kind of shut the mind off, um, which is there's nothing more uh, frightening for the mind than that temptation. So it's just going to come back stronger. Um, so what we do is we engage the mind. And, and what I like to do is give it a task. So, you know, we will be doing actual physical activity while we're engaging the other elements. Um, and this is also very known within the Sufi tradition. So, you know, you would have people weaving the carpets while they're learning their, their courses, because what that does is engage the mind with something productive and repetitive. So it doesn't need to come and interrupt the spirit of the heart while it's learning. Um, so, you know, for me, it is very much the engagement of the mind, but because whether you're in the West or not, the Western mentality is very much part of globalization and the overemphasis on the mind is part of that. Um, especially with the emphasis on science. So, you know, my program really is about engaging the mind with a task versus what you would be calling awakening the mind. Like, you know, that I think is more of a advanced process once you come into an integrated space, which is my main goal is the first step is in integration. I mean, it's, uh, so could, you know, when it comes to Matthew's community, you know, and, uh, and, and, and understanding how, um, the journey uh, it takes for a, an individual who's, you know, all caught up in, you know, the fundamentals of Islam, for example, and not necessarily looking at their, 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 and, and, and wanting to, who's obviously was participating in your, in your programming and wanting to investigate themselves more and where their spirituality lies with investigating themselves. What's a real world example. You may not mentioning any names of it, but of, of a journey someone took uh, to, to actualize themselves within the tradition of to maintaining the traditions of Islam, but also um, getting to a destination of awakening. So, so I'll share my journey because I feel like that's the safest place when it comes to this because, you know, I, I, I generally don't. But, you know, there was a moment where, um, you know, particularly, you know, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, when it was one nation, you know, I saw Sudan partition into South Sudan. I was in the room back and stuff. You know, you, you absorb so much trauma. Um, and for me, a lot of this was done in the name of my faith. Um, you know, I remember sitting in Khartoum and talking to young Muslim men who by all definitions were amazing young men justifying Darfur to me using Islamic text. Um, and, you know, they, and they were trying to explain to me a concept of forced marriage and, you know, all of it is, is not there and it's misinterpretation, but it hurt so deeply to hear mm -hmm. the words that inspired me being thrown in my face to justify violence. Um, and I had a real faith shaking experience. You know, I was at a crossroads and I had to, you know, I, I just had to question. And, and I was struggling with the fact that I was questioning my faith and, and really questioning God in, in all forms. Um, and what I did, and this is how a lot of my exercises were then developed, which I moved into my curriculum, 
is I really went through, um, I traced the whole emotion and the thought down to the initial story. Uh, and what I realized from that was that, you know, because I kind of learned my faith on my own, you know, again, in South Carolina, there weren't a lot of peers. Um, I had managed to put God in a very small box and it was, you know, the punisher and the rewarder, um, which ironically represent, you know, also mirrors patriarchy. Um, and, you know, God doesn't like being contained and he definitely doesn't like being in a small box. So he blew up my world and in blowing up my world is how I refound God. And so what I do is exercises that push whatever each individual who arrives to go through what box, what container did you create for your faith and how do you make it much larger? So it really represents the divine. Um, and that's through, again, storytelling. It's through sharing and it's through very specific exercises that are um, very, very much based on experiential learning. So, you know, every workshop ends up looking different, which is why it's so hard to say, you know, I do A, B, C. It's not an equation. It's the level of experiences that create the consciousness towards growth and evolving. I appreciate you sharing that. I think that um, I, I wanted to pitch Matt on this one because I, it, it's got to echo a little bit. I know I, my experiences in the South of dealing with um, uh, or interacting with, with Christian communities. My one friend from Kentucky used to say that her uncle was a pastor and she used to hide underneath the pews when he used to preach because it was a fire and brimstone. Um, but maybe, maybe Matthew, you'd talk a little bit about how, because there's a direct connection of, of the idea of uh, putting God in a box um, and, and how uh, Manal's journey expressed out of that, she broke out of that um, through her, 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 her journey of self-awareness, um, particularly because of all the in, in engagement that she had been doing internationally. But you've been international. You know what you've been dealt with, you know, tangled in D.C., and your community struggles with this too. Yeah, I, I think the way I might uh, produce a parallel is that I, I do see a lot of Christians, um, or well, let me back up, a lot of people who grew up in a, a particular Christian context um, that uh, absorbed uh, whatever teaching was coming from the pulpit in Sunday school at the time, uh, only to then later grow up and have maybe some kind of conflict like Manal described uh, and really investigate the scriptures for themselves and find that what they learned growing up was not necessarily what's in scripture uh, or what's taught in scripture. And so that produces at least a couple different reactions, right? You either leave the faith completely uh, or um, you have a faith renewal um, that is still Christian mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, it's a, a, you know, salvation uh, or it's, it's understanding of salvation and, uh, and the centrality of Christ, um, but maybe there's a lot of other stuff that you discard. Uh, and so I see that pretty frequently. Um, I think it's not just a Southern thing, um, but uh, it, it's certainly a common uh, faith thing. Uh, and I think some of the, you know, big picture data about religion in America from say, it's probably Pew and Gallup, I forget who did it um, more recently, but talks about um, how frequently uh, people in America change their religious association. So we're, we're all, it's a, it's a political season. And so we're always evaluating uh, what Christian groups are, or what religious groups are doing what with respect to politics. Um, but there's a it's pretty interesting story that uh, people are using their freedom of conscience to uh, change religions, even if it's not uh, as dramatic as say uh, Christianity to Islam or vice versa, but certainly within the Christian space, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of, a lot of changeover. And I think some of that, has to do with um, uh, being taught one thing when you when you're little, um, maybe in a particular understanding, a particular interpretation, and then uh, growing growing up and, and kind of owning it for yourself. Um, maybe it's corrective, um, maybe it's augmenting. Um, you know, some people there's a particularly among a couple of the younger generations uh, who grew up in what we call low church evangelical space, um, uh, independent churches. Um, there's often an attraction to 
older churches like the Anglican Church or the or the or Catholicism. Uh, there's something about those traditions that that people really uh, gravitate to. Um, they feel like they're more connected in some cases to an older body of believers and, and traditions. Um, I I would of course, sometimes challenge that because I think there's, al there's always been diversity uh, in Christianity going way back uh, to the early days. We see conflicts even among the disciples developing pretty early on that they have to uh, eventually reconcile. But that's kind of my riff uh, uh, to your question, John. I, I appreciate you sharing it because I think that connectivity is, is, is important, you know, within our respective communities to chat a little bit about how, you know, we've, we struggle with what we know and we're, what we're comfortable with. And sometimes it's, I always think about your comment about reading on, you know, someone says, this is what the Bible's about. You go read on, you know? Mm. So um, mm. it's reading. the same thing with the, with the Quran, you know, it's like, totally. it's the same thing. It's read on, read on. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I had a, this experience when I was visiting Af Af Afghanistan in, in 2012 and, 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 I had an I had a at, at the American Islamic Congress had this event with Russell Campbell who marched with Martin Luther King and you know he this even part of the civil rights movement a really unbelievable uh, guy and and we were talking about how what we did is we translated the Montgomery story into both Farsi and Arabic and it was used in the Arab Spring and people you know in the Arab Spring had signs that said we shall overcome and we were you know really proud of ourselves and uh, about all that stuff and um, and. He had mentioned in his speech, we were talking about the civil rights movement and, and the Arab Spring, and he had mentioned this whole thing about how when he went to Africa, he got his, his African name and he got very emotional about it. Uh, and I, I, I didn't understand that moment when, it, when he said it. Uh, and uh, and I, I was processing it, but, and, and later, years later, two years later, when, we had the, when I went to Afghanistan, I, I had met distant members of the family who had were calling me yeah yeah you know and uh and he he it, it, and I had that exact moment and it was it was non-Quranic it was non-Islamic mm. it was not it but at that moment it actualized the journey that my family had taken four centuries you know four, four generations ago out of out of Afghanistan and and defending who we are as as a family and all the spiritual components and the identity catalyzed into that moment, um, which meant something profound for me, which is why part of the reason why I do what I do. Um, but, uh, but I think that, that these, these, these spiritual moments are so important because as people that deal with the conflict and deal with our communities and are actively, uh, our business is peace, our business is the community, the Umma, our business is all these things. Um, mm -hmm. It's so important for us to constantly we're constantly tested on who we are in our identity on a spiritual level and on mm. on a secular level and on on an intellectual level and, and physical level that that um the journey is it's uh, is is these these epiphany moments are so important because they allow us to anchor ourselves even though we might deal with struggle in the future but um but i think that there's a lot of importance when it comes to what you do uh manal and and your and your your organization matthew do you 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 want to have a question here yeah I, i've got one more question but i also um given the your previous question about uh faith experiences that we talked about just a few moments ago i'd be remiss if i didn't point out that uh, within evangelical circles uh, probably Christian circles broadly in America, uh, in light of the Me Too revelations that uh, that are pretty common, um, there are a lot of stories uh, coming out um, of women who were abused at young ages um, within the context of the church, um, and some pretty pretty um, stunning uh, stories, quite frankly, of how women have experienced that and um, somehow. Uh, have not discarded the faith entirely and actually uh, found renewal and healing uh, through the faith in spite of um, having really terrible and traumatic experiences uh, at the hands of faith leaders and pastors and, and sometimes family members. So um, Rachel Del Hollander is, is one of those uh, women who've spoken out um, pretty pretty bravely and very effectively um, um, among others. So we, we're seeing that kind of trend within uh, American Christianity uh, that kind of dovetails with a lot of Manal's work. Um, Manal, I want to ask you about um, your time 
we've recognized that in your bio and in your history, you've spent a lot of time in war zones. You've spent time working on conflict resolution, uh, although you're interested more so now in trying to prevent conflict, um, working upstream. Um, but you've done a lot of work and, and have a lot of insight into what women bring to the table in the context of peace building and conflict resolution. Can you paint a picture for that for our listeners, uh, what it means uh, for women to be a part of the table? Um, even you touched a little bit about the negotiating skills that you helped develop, but why is it important that women um, are, are, are basically at the table, so to speak, um, when mm -hmm. trying to stem conflict either before it happens or resolve it after the fact? Absolutely. I mean, you know, and to be clear, you know, of course, both sides are needed. So you need women and you need men. And, and I feel like it's always important to make that statement, you know, that it's not the idea of women coming in to replace men, but it's the idea of women side by side with men. Um, so if men were absent, I would be pushing that men need to be at the table. It's just that they're not absent. So they're there in strong numbers. Um, you know, and it's just kind of it, kind of speaking from a faith perspective, it's about the seen and the unseen. Um, speaking from an economics perspective, it's about the formal and the informal. And, you know, women really do bring that informal role into the table. Um, and, you know, the example I like to give is actually, I saw this both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know, when, when, you know, at the time I was predominantly working with the U.S. government and they're trying to access neighborhoods, they're trying to get an idea of, you know, who are the foreign fighters, who are the extremists. And honestly, it was my connection with the women. They would always know. They know every child that's playing on the street and they know who that child belongs to. And so they would be like, oh, these three, we don't know them. Who are those three? And so it is an early detection warning sign. And it was women in Anbar before, you know, Mosul really got to a height. They're the ones who came to my office and said, hey, we don't recognize half the people in our neighborhood and we're scared. And that's how we knew there was an increase in foreign fighters when, you know, at one point we were celebrating Anbar as this big win and then it kind of flipped to the other side. So, you know, mo my whole line is it's not nice, it's necessary to engage women. Um, you know, I had a lot of US generals kind of push at me and just kind of, you know, snap and be like, well, as soon as we secure the country, we can talk about your women. And I'd be like, mm -hmm. listen, until you talk about my women, you won't secure the country. Mm -hmm. They're the eyes, the ears, the pulse of the community. Um, you know, the other thing, and, and I believe this is power dynamics, I don't believe it's gender. Um, but, you know, women do have a more horizontal style of leadership. So they will consult. They will look at, you know, um, you know engaging communities. Um, they, had a, they hold a different form of moral authority. I love the women in Nigeria. Like when Boko Haram was like really doing like mass to recruit very, very young men, they did a flip narrative campaign where they started poking fun at those youth being like you're so weak you've got to prove yourself be a real man and stand up to these extremists and they kind of with a kind of tongue-in-cheek flipped the narrative of the extremists by basically also questioning their masculinity and showing that violence wasn't masculine but it took the nigerian women to know how to reach their youth all our campaigns you know were just falling flat because we didn't know how to read we being the u.s government didn't know how to reach them also underscores the point of trying to elevate local leadership um, uh, among among the actors that uh, even where international organizations and other nation states can try to play a role and, and, and can play positive roles, you really need those local leaders and personalities. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, it's the first question any security official is going to ask is who holds moral authority? Right. And yeah. consistently, I have to respond, religious leaders, like you can't ignore that, like they hold moral authority. It changed the game, like let's if you want to look at public health and less political, it changed the game on the war on AIDS in Africa when we engaged the churches, it, it completely changed it. Um, so you need moral authority, and that's from a security lens, and moral authority tends to fall within religion, whether we want to like it or not, it's a fact. Yeah. I mean, engagement modeling is so important. I mean, the, who has access to the different constituencies, different communities within within a country or within a conflict zone? And you know, if you're if you're if you're ignoring women, you, you're you're alienating. You're you're losing access essentially to Absolutely. whole swaths of the community, um, and you're also losing a. Uh, a, a moral beacon within the family unit and community unit that is relied on on a daily basis. Um, so it's a it's 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 a, a profound moment as someone has participated in a lot of these roundtables. You know, it's it used to be 
a women's round table and a men's round table about peace building. And now they're much more integrated, which, you know, over the last 20 years, it's, it's, uh, it's gotten to where it needed to be. And it's yeah. there's still a lot of headway. But I remember sitting, you know, at Yusuf with uh, Ambassador Steiner. It was like me and, okay. and just Ambassador Steiner with a whole bunch of ladies. And, uh, and they were like, this is our round table. And we're like, well, we're going to sit here because we yeah. got to start figuring out a way to actualize this over the next 20 years. And it's happened. So, um, but, uh, but it's, I think it's a profound, you know, question and, and, and point to make because I always say a lot of the, a lot of the guys that are participating in peace building from a Muslim, from a Muslim perspective in these Muslim countries would love to have women and participate, but they just don't have the tools on the tool belt. They, they, they don't know uh, how to interact uh, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a formal setting about peace building with their, their counterparts. Now that, that may not be true now. Uh, but, but certainly 20 years ago it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and that was a difficult task. And, and, and it's because of the work that you've done over the last 20 years, but certainly, um, you know, and, and many others, but it, the, the accessibility to the, the information and these constituencies is so important because you miss something and, an entire conflict can go sideways. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So. I mean, I think that's one of the thing, you know, kind of, again, the, the painful thing about being in the conflict and peace building space was watching how preventable so much of the worst crises were. Look, like, we saw mm. it coming. We knew the early detection. Yeah. We were warning. We were ringing the bell. And, you know, like you said, something slipped or something slid and you saw it explode. And it, I think that's why I had to take the steps back and look at prevention because it was like, we saw all of this and did nothing. Um, and, and I don't want to say did nothing because that's not fair to all those people who do such hard work, but like, uh, it's like, how do you miss this? And, and you know, I still don't know the answer, but it's what I work towards. Yeah. yeah and all I, Omar. I, I'm, nope, I think, I, no, I, th I think that it, it's so important because of the, that component of trying to get into prevention as, you know, treating, there was a program at AIC where we were treating conflict like a, a sickness, an illness. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and and trying to figure out the indicators and saying, well, you, you you would go to a group of doctors to get opinions. And we have the doctors within our communities. We have the specialists. So yeah. we need to kind of and that might be just that might be a, a, just a guy who's from a region or, or a gal who's from a region. It just yeah. it might just Absolutely. be that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I love yes. that you're saying that because this is the thing that I try to get people to understand about approaching religious leaders, right? Because, you know, you have the fiqh based religious leaders, which is like approaching the judicial system. And right. sometimes that's not who holds moral authority. Like we tend to go to very heavy fiqh driven mm -hmm. imams. And then you have the spiritual imams, which will be like the medical doctor. And when the spirit's in pain, you go to the medical doctor. But, you know, a lot of times when we we're going to engagement, we were going to the justice, like judicial or to the law base. And it's like, you need to go to the health wellness space, which is a different imam. And I don't even think Muslims understand that like nuanced difference. But that was what I kept pushing is like, you're, you're going to, it's like going to the Supreme Court when you need to go to a hospital. And I think that's one of the mm -hmm. biggest mistakes we make in imam engagement. Just my two cents. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right about that. I, I you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it, you know, it's very difficult also from when someone who doesn't understand the diversity of the roles of an imam in, in the Islamic culture, what their stake is and who, and, and, and really their realm of authority and how they, they interact with the, their, their, their constituencies. It's, and it's, it's, it's an art. If you you know there, there's a it's like a PhD you get a PhD in how and in, in knowing the different sects but also from there um, who is responsible for what and on, exactly. a, on a spiritual level or a legal level or or a societal level or a familial level you know it, you know it, and, and it's it's very very difficult to navigate those waters even if you know <laughs> yeah yeah you, absolutely so. Manal Omar, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank even, you for more having so, me. even more so for your uh, pretty fascinating insights uh, and sharing a bit of your life with us. Um, where can folks find more information about you and your organization? Um, you go to my website, www.crossredlines.com. Um, we're launching a new campaign called um, Let Love In 2020. So follow the hashtag on all social media. That'll be launched next week. Um, and we hope that you can share ways that you let love in because that's really the ultimate goal of peace building. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Manon. This has been Thank Crossing you. Fades with John Pinna and Matt Hawkins.